limited versus unlimited atonement. So if you saw my introduction to the series, I talked about the two camps. So the free will position, which incorporates most of Christianity, using that term very loosely, and that includes most of free grace, of course. And then the election position, which incorporates mainly Calvinist and Reformed Protestants, but also sovereign grace as a distinct subcategory of free grace, I would say. Maybe people will disagree with that. But as I like to call them, the chosen Charlies and the free will Freddies. So the free will Freddies generally subscribe to unlimited atonement, whereby they say that Jesus atoned for everybody. Uh, Jesus loved everybody. Jesus died for everybody. God wants every single person to be saved. But because most people use their free will decisionism to reject the gospel, most of them won't be. Whereas the chosen Charlies say that Jesus only died for the elect, Jesus only loved the elect, uh, Jesus, God only wants the a remnant to be saved, but God will get exactly what he wants, and, and this is what you might call limited atonement. Okay. Now, I also explained in the series introduction that I don't fit on either end of the scale. So, although I'm predestination leaning, you will perhaps hopefully understand why I'm not entirely sovereign grace either. And I'm not just trying to be different or edgy. Um, that there are two problems that I perceive with this entire debate. The the first problem being the false dichotomies of choice being presented here. You know, it's either this or it's this. The second problem is the biblical definition of atonement, which in my view has nothing to do with most other items that come under these two choices of limited versus unlimited atonement. So if we were to take a bunch of different verses across the New Testament about all the things that God did, pertaining to our salvation. Uh, limited and unlimited atonement applies the same group of people to every item on the list. So, for example, the free will Freddies will say that Jesus atoned for the sins of everyone, every single person that is, that ever existed. Jesus died for everyone. God so loved everyone. Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. The gospel can be believed by anyone or everyone. Whereas Chosen Charlie says that Jesus only atoned for the sins of the elect, Jesus only died for the sins of the elect, God so loved the elect, Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the elect, God wants the elect to be saved, the gospel can be believed by the elect only. There are more items that I'm sure we could add to that list, but I'm sure you get the point. Now, my biggest problem with this false dichotomy is, like, my question would be, who is forcing all of those items that I listed to be the same. Why do they have to all be the same? I, I, I don't get that. And I'm sure someone will explain it in the comments, but I don't get why they have to be the same. For example, is it not possible that God loved every person, but only atoned for the elect? Or is it not possible that Jesus died for every single person, but the gospel can only be believed by the elect or vice versa? Why, why do they all have to be the same answer? Why? Like, I, I don't get why. Okay. So, I can't answer all of these items in one video. So, I'll, I'll focus on, let's focus on God's love for a second here. And, and for the sake of the subject matter, the atonement, I'll cover later as well. If So, if we read John 3.16, that God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who is the world? Is it every single person in existence? or believers of every tribe, tongue, and nation across the world? Or does it have a different meaning altogether? Okay. Well, this is a funny one because the word world is used frequently in John's Gospel. And I haven't counted, but if you look at it in a concordance, it seems as if it's almost as frequent as the word believe, which is saying something in John's Gospel. So you can easily cherry pick and say, well, in verse chapter 7, verse 7, the world means all sinners because Jesus rebukes its evil works. But in chapter 1, verse 29, he takes away the sins of the world, and unsaved are still in their sins, so it must mean every believer. Yet in chapter 1, verse 9, it's every man that comes into the world, so it must mean every lost individual. Or 
in chapter 12, verse 19, the Pharisees used it as hyperbole to refer to everybody going after Jesus. So you can see that there's a lot of games going on about what the world could mean there, depending on which verse you want to focus on. But the, the issue is not who did God love? Okay, well, we know he loved the world, but the issue is how did God love the world? Well, he loved it such that this world which knew him not, this world that hates him, uh, this this world that is, is he is not of, he, he nevertheless loved it enough to send his son to die so as to not condemn it and take away its sins so that it might be saved. Okay. Now, we all agree and understand that most of the world won't receive him. But he, that doesn't change the fact that he loved it enough to do the works necessary to save it right so that's god's love for the world but i i would say that that's got nothing to do with the atonement because mainly because that's not what atonement means so the word atone means to make amends or to do some kind of tangible action to show that you are sorry for something that you did wrong or failed to do right it's rarely used in the New Testament. It's mainly an Old Testament word, actually, but our English Bible uses two words for the same Greek word, the other being reconciliation. Uh, again, used a small number of times. Uh, and it, it's, Reconciliation essentially means for two enemies to be brought together as, as friends or, or neutrals, if you like. And so you see that pattern in the Old Testament that the people sinned. They became enemies with God. So they needed to offer an atoning sacrifice to be reconciled back to God, right? And, and Romans 5 explains that we are justified by faith, we have peace with God, and by this faith, we have access to God's grace. Well, I think we would agree that only saved people have access to grace. Only the saved have peace with God in that regard. Only the saved are justified by faith. And so in that, that same chapter tells us that we shall be saved from wrath through him. We were enemies we were reconciled, we also join in God, by whom we have now received the atonement, he says. So, using the Romans 5 definition of atonement, well, only those who are justified by faith have been reconciled, only they have received the atonement. So in that sense, only that only applies to saved, because only the saved have had their sins atoned for, right? But that, that limited, that form of limited atonement, I'm just going on a very basic biblical definition of atonement. Not all of this alphabet soup definition that the Calvinists are all talking about. That, that's got nothing to do with it. And, and I would really separate this from whether God loved the world or not, or whether God wants everybody to be saved or not, or whether Jesus tasted death for every man or not. Because I think those are different questions and not what atonement means. So I wouldn't really lump those things into these two categories of unlimited versus limited atonement. Okay. So I would just say, to sort of bring this to a, to a close, is that using the simple Romans 5 definition of atonement, you don't need to be an expert theologian or a reformed Bible scholar to understand it. You just need to do a five-second search on what the word atone means. And a quick search on Bible Hub to look for a passage that actually uses the word atonement, it's really not that complicated at all. So in that respect, atonement applies to the people whose sins have been atoned. If your sins haven't been atoned for, you're not atoned, you don't have an atonement. So in that respect, it, it does apply to the saved. Not to be confused with whether other people can be saved, that, that's a different question. Okay. But you see, the problem when we took, when we use these terms is that we've had a lot of theologian fancy types like the Calvinists and the Catholics that they use so many complicated swelling words that they inevitably make the gospel itself complicated and they think that they're going to heaven because they're so intellectual and smart and they love to debate how right they are. But really then they're, they're nonsense will perish with them.